<laughs> well, I'll tell you. Everybody make sure they thank Jim Host for his limousine. We haven't taken one in 15 years. <laughs> Since my high school prom, I haven't had a limousine. <laughs> Thanks to Jim Host. Is that him? Hi. I'm Laura from United Cerebral Palsy. We're having an auction here on December 6th. Sure. We'd like to auction the balls. The ball. Now, they pay $25 for the ball, so they want to make sure they get at least they get the money. <laughs> What's someone else's name? <laughs> Your name, because I understand that that's worth the most. Not anybody else. Well, you've done that more than once. You have very good handwriting. Did you go to Catholic school? Yes. I knew. I knew. Saint Dominic. Saint Dominic. <laughs> Thank you very much. You're welcome. Nice seeing you. Here we are, New York. Place has got to be close to your heart. You know, when you want to have an exciting weekend and you can get away on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, there's no better place to spend a weekend in New York City. Being at Mickey Mantle's, he played so many years at Yankee Stadium. And you made a lot of ball games as a youngster at Yankee Stadium. I would say 20 day games every summer for five, six years. I knew uh, because I was one train stop away from Yankee Stadium when my grandmother lived right off the Grand Concourse. Uh, Moose Garin at first base, Bobby Richardson at second, Tony Kubik at short, Cletus Boyer uh, at third base. Uh, behind the plate was Johnny Blanchard later replaced by Elston Howard, Whitey Ford on the mound, Maris, Manlin, Hector Lopez and left, and it was really exciting. Should we go through the bullpen? <laughs> I can tell you. <laughs> I bet you could tell us. It, it, was, it was a time for me, and to this day, when they collect these baseball cards and they all say about, about how much they love Mantle or Maris, that was the era that I grew up in, and I, and I was so lucky as a kid. I had two female cousins, Jan and Elaine, and we were sat in the bleachers, 20 times a summer, and what a treat that was. And that was an ines inexpensive way for my grandmother to get rid of me for the afternoon. Did you know, growing up here, did you know you were going to be as successful as you are now? No, I, you know, I got, uh, knock on wood, that I, I feel we are successful. But no, I, the only thing I was trying to do was survive and did not know what my niche would be because I was growing up in a, in a very tough environment. Uh, it was when... Uh, there were quite a few gangs present, there, were, there was a lot of turmoil in the neighborhood, so to speak, and, and I did not want any part of any of that growing up. And my only way to get out of that environment was sports. And I didn't know at the time whether it would be baseball or basketball, because baseball was my first love. What drives you? I know a lot of people would like to ask you this question. They wonder what makes Rick Pitino tick, but what really drives you? Well, I think there are a number of things that drive people. One thing, fear of failure drives a lot of people. Uh, the ability to succeed in life and reach a certain plateau and, and manage it, get more creative and make it even bigger. I don't know. I just like to live for the moment, whatever it may be. I want to have the greatest season that I've had as a coach each year out. And I don't look too far ahead. I'm goal-oriented, but I won't look too far ahead. In other words, I won't say in 
in, in five years I want to be here or I want to be there. Uh, recently somebody who was a money manager came up to me and said, well, you know, well, what are your goals? I said, I have no goals in terms of money. In terms of basketball, it's based on the season, not on the longevity of my career. And so I never look back and I never look too far ahead. I always look at the present tense. A lot of people talk about the money you make and it comes with success, obviously. Not too long ago, you had a decision to make. You could have made a heck of a lot more money than you're making at the University of Kentucky. Some NBA folks were after you, and the decision was to stay in Kentucky. Was that all your decision? Was Joanne a big part of that? Was the entire family a big part of that? Uh, no question, we're all part of that, but it all depends on what you, how you describe being rich. If you, if you describe being rich in terms of money, then I think you're probably a very poor man. I, I base my whole life professionally outside of my family on winning and if i feel that being winning is my common denominator i have the ability to win then i know opportunities to meet new people uh new opportunities in business new opportunities in life trail behind me as my shadow when we win the reason professional teams were after me besides i had the prerequisite of what professional teams are looking for that i have head coaching experience in the pros is that i'm being perceived as a winner because we were at 30 and four and went to the final four. Have a 500 season, you'll see how many pro teams are after me. What's your greatest achievement and your biggest disappointment? As a basketball coach? Yes. As a coach, I would say the greatest achievement is Providence College going to the final four. Because that was, as I look back, the most mediocre team I think ever to enter a final four. And interesting enough, we were in the toughest bracket and we blow out three to four teams we're playing. It was just, um, it captured your imagination, that basketball team. Biggest disappointment? Oh, I would say biggest disappointment um, as a coach was the fact that I took the Nick job. Well, maybe I should have stayed at Providence. I let ego get in the way of a place that, that had happiness. And when I say ego is you grow up 10 streets from Madison Square Garden and you now have the opportunity of a lifetime. So in one sense, I'm disappointed that I took it. But the other but how sense, can you pass that up? Well, in hindsight, it was the greatest move I could ever make because the knowledge that I gained from a coaching standpoint was invaluable to my success today. But on the other hand, I felt, even to this day, I feel guilty. I disappointed so many people in a very small city of Providence that I left. And uh, everybody said, oh, don't worry about that. But I do. I am concerned about people. Maybe everybody doesn't see, and maybe you don't want them to see, all the work you do for charities and, and for different people, that you really helped out a lot. Well, I'll tell you an interesting story, and this is, uh, I won't go into the charity work. We've raised over half a million dollars for charities, and I never publicize what we give or what we don't give. Recently, I, we took our basketball team to Owensboro, Kentucky, to open a homeless shelter. Do you know that Dr. Weddington got over 10 phone calls the next day complaining that I took the team for a Catholic benefit and that they would like to have it for them, when in fact it was not a Catholic benefit. It was for a homeless shelter for all denominations, a soup kitchen, so to speak, for the poor. Anytime you give, like I give to, this year I gave a substantial amount of money to seven different charities. I won't publicize that because although you made seven charities happy, there were 15 charities out there saying, well, why didn't you think of me? So the worst thing you can do, anytime you do a good deed, the worst thing that can happen to you is when you get publicity behind your good deed. What's your best coaching move in a game and what is your worst coaching move in a game? Um, I think there were a number of coaching moves in that 14 and 14 season that stand out. Uh, it, my greatest moments would go back again to Providence College because you ha every time out had to be your greatest motivational speech just to get these guys to perform at an average rate. So it, that was way beyond anything I could ever imagine. Uh, you know, the worst coaching decision I made, I think, a lot of people think it was not putting a guy in the ball in the Duke game. And, and, and at that point in time, I, I second-guessed myself. I have to be honest with myself, because I did. Because you do. We discussed it the entire time out, whether to put a person on the ball and not on the ball. And I know Nidus come out and says he never puts a guy on the ball. And 
and I've watched it, and I've seen people put guys on the ball last season and lose five straight games with a person on the ball. That didn't bother me. What bothers me is I went out. They made, I think, 15 foul shots in a row, whatever number it was at the time. I said, look, guys, we got to make a steal here. We knew the ball was going to late, at least we guessed that way. I had Pelfrey behind. I said, Fellhouse, go for the steal. Don't be afraid to go for the steal. And then I made my biggest mistake. I got a little negative. I said, whatever you do, Darren, don't foul. If I would have just said, be aggressive and go for the steal and leave out don't foul, maybe he would have been a little bit more of a gambler. Instead, he went like this and was so afraid, obviously Leighton made all his foul shots in a row to go for the steal. So that, I think, was my biggest mistake in bringing up a negative when all that was called for at that moment were positives. What makes you happiest? What angers you most? To me, practice, be it individual instruction or practice from three to five, I'm at my happiest moment. Uh, trying to improve players' skills is the happiest time in my life. Again, I'll say outside of intimate things that you share with your family. And to me, uh, what upsets me the most is when you're recruiting and innuendos, accusations made when people are breaking the rules to get, to, to get a player. That bothers me beyond uh, belief. Uh, that player, uh, that coaches would take their values and just try and put them on the back burner to try and take a shortcut to success, which, by the way, is short-lived when they do that because it's blackmail. It's player blackmail when they buy a player. It appears you have some very close friends, some we will talk with here tonight. What does real friendship mean to you? Well, I try in every situation I've been at, from Hawaii to Syracuse to Boston to to Providence, New Jersey, New York, and now Kentucky, if you can leave every state with two or three really close friends, you're a very wealthy man. And a lot of people say if you can count on your one hand some special friends, you are a wealthy man. And I, and I like to think that. I like to think that if I could leave certain places with some special friends, uh, it's, it would be a rewarding experience for me. And I have some very good ones in Kentucky. I think one thing to say about Rick is uh, he's a regular person. You know, everyone says, well, he likes the limelight, he likes being in front of the, you know, the whole spotlight, what goes on. He's a regular guy. I mean, all these guys know Rick very well. You know you play golf with him. He likes to just let his hair down, break chops like everyone else, give you the needle, and go out and have a few beers. And, you know, he try, wants to be a regular guy. He doesn't, you know, everyone perceives him as being a high-profile guy. And that's really not the way he is. You know, he comes out, he comes across, he'll give anything that you need. Call him up if you're in a jam and say, Rick, I need this. He said, yeah, fine. He's all he is. He doesn't big time, which is why me and him, I think, we get along so well. Plus, he, you know, he's a ball breaker. You know, with, you know, <laughs> you know with that yeah. we all know about him, I That's guess, right. you know. <laughs> Ray, uh, give us your impressions. Of, uh, well, I've known Rick, for, I guess, for about, uh, I guess, about 10 years now, yeah. something like that. And uh, I know him through Billy, and, uh, you know, he's always been just as regular a guy, as Billy said, just as regular a guy as you can imagine considering what he's gone through over the last 10 years since I've known him from being an assistant coach to being, uh, you know, the head coach at, a, at an incredible school for basketball, you know. And I think that uh, the way he's handled the whole thing is just, just unbelievable. <clears throat> and you could talk to him now and you could, you know, he remember things that happened between the two of us or the four of us uh, back six or seven years ago, just as though it was uh, yesterday. So, I mean... I think that uh, that is just amazing. Joey, you played against him here at Holy Cross and he was at UMass. Let's go back to that time. Did you really know him that well then? No, what I didn't. was it like to play against him? Well, he wasn't our main concern back at UMass. <laughs> uh, Al Skinner and some of the other players are a little better than Rick, but uh, he was certainly a very hard-nosed guard, very tough guy to guard and a real good shooter. But uh, he wasn't the primary uh, the primary problem when we played UMass that year, they had a lot of good players that year and they had a great team. Was he a quiet guy? Was he a get-in-your-face guy? Was oh, he he's a get, guy? No, he's a get-in-your-face guy. And uh, I would say on the basketball court, uh, as hard-nosed as you're going to meet, you know, real, real tough guys and loves a game and loves, loves to, loves a competition, really. And he still does. And whether it's golf or anything else that we play, it's, uh, he has the same fire uh, that he had in college. Did you draw the assignment defensively on him, or did he ever draw the defensive assignment? Well, I usually guarded the best guy, so, so I didn't, didn't get Rick. <laughs> <laughs> I want to give you one good story about Rick at Saratoga. You know, 
talking about, you know, what he wants to do is win. That's all he cares. He ha I was with him several days, but he never lost the race. It doesn't make any difference who wins the race. At the end of the race, he said, I told you that that was the horse who's going to win the race. Now, he might not have picked that horse, but it, invariably, he picks the horse. He says six right horses in the race, or eight horses in the race at the end. As soon as the horse, and at the beginning of the race, he says, this horse, you know, but he'll always talk about everything, but as soon as the horse finishes the race, I told you that horse was going to win the race. This is for Mr. Pitino tonight with a little garlic, little olive oil, nice tomatoes over the linguine, and that's what he's going to eat. Tomatoes over the linguine, and that's what he's going to eat. Buonasera, Mr. Pitino. How are you? Come stai? Very good to see you. Great coach of the world. <laughs> Mr. Minardi, how are you? Good to see you. Please come, I have your table ready. Well, Johnny, we're going to wait for the girls. Magnificent. Sit down. Open up a bottle of wine. Wait, wine? Mr. Pitino, you're always very welcome in my restaurant, you know that. And thanks to you, my popularity is immense. <laughs> way before me. Remember the story on how we opened up the I, restaurant I, in Kentucky? I remember every single bit of it mm -hmm. because I'm supposed to be your partner. That's right. And then I say, we have, we have to let Pitino do his way. I am a very commanding restaurateur. And uh, if we would have created only a conflict. We would have made a great restaurant, no question about it. But you did it yourself. And it's very popular as yours. And make my popular too. We have to tell you, when the players came in here to eat before the game, before we play St. John's, Johnny figured, these guys are big, they, he's got to feed them well. I cook a storm of food. So, <laughs> they no eat. But the players eat very lightly before a game, four hours before a game. They After eat. a game. Well, Johnny came time. out with three huge pieces of chicken, pasta, appetizers, and these guys are just praying it would happen after the game, but it had four hours before the game. That particular uh, week, my restaurant was no more a New York restaurant. It was Kentucky. I almost started to speak like a Kentuckian. <laughs> it was fantastic. We had that I want to see. <laughs> That's very difficult for a real Italian fellow. It's impossible. We had more people from Kentucky in here than we have from New York City. Bye bye. It's a shame. You played in the garden. Yeah. Even the governor was here. Everybody. He gave me a horse. A gold, little gold horse he gave me. It's still, it's still running. Uh, I think it's dead. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Pitino, why don't you come back in New York and try to make win the Knicks? Why would he give up Kentucky? Why would he? Uh, New York is a beautiful town. <laughs> Stay away from the pros. Stay with the college. You can't miss. Tell him that, uh, he's almost the president of Kentucky. No, that happened right. already. He's You've already. never been president in New York. He's more important than the president in Kentucky. Believe <laughs> the, 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 what is his name? We, we mentioned him before. The governor of Kentucky. Vernon Jones. First come Pitino, then come Vernon Jones. And so you want to give that up? <laughs> He'll be happy to hear that. Can't speak <laughs> 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 You're going to stay long in New York, Mr. Pitino? Uh, till we're going home Thursday morning. We're going to see Billy Joel tonight. That's a nice show to see. I envy you. I have to work. <laughs> there they are. Oh, le belle signore sono arrivate. <laughs> Buonasera, signora. Hi, How are you? <laughs> How are you, signora? How are you? Good to see you. Thank you. Hi. Buonasera, signora. Come, please. I have your table ready, honey. Thank you. Don't let me forget that. Okay. Step. Signora, look Step what a beautiful lobster and what a gorgeous fish I have tonight. Oh. This is oh. a gorgeous lobster. A female. Ready for to make a nice sauce. Come. <laughs> You're still moving. How you doing, buddy? <laughs> what kind of a pasta you like to have? Fettuccine, penne, rigatoni. Rigatoni? Rigatoni? Molto bene. We're going to make rigatoni with a little... Oil and garlic, fresh tomato, and basil, just like mother used to make. And if you don't Johnny, like make it, enough so I can bring a, a batch back to Kentucky. To the governor? <laughs> no, for me. <laughs> this is going to be a very tasty 
A little red pepper. And that's it. In 10 minutes, we'll be ready. You're going to taste it too. <laughs> Thank you. It's unlike if you go to a Chinese restaurant or if you go to other gourmet French restaurants, an hour later you're calling up some type of Italian pizza place looking to get something to eat because you're hungry. When you leave Bravo Gianni, you you're never hungry. hungry. <laughs> Nobody's skinny here. <laughs> Play piano, man. That was, that's his last time for number. And they uh -huh. played it, and he had the whole the whole garden sang piano, man, back to him. He would play some harmonica. Do you know Billy Joel? He's Manic. from Hicksville, and that's where Joanne grew up. Hicksville. Oh, did she know him then? No, no. She's he's probably not. a little bit old. He's 45, maybe Joanne's 40. And uh, but Billy Joel put on the best concert I've ever heard of. There's nothing. What's your favorite kind of music? As far as I like Billy stuff. Joel. Uh, he be uh, see number one. Yeah, probably. Uh, I like Frank Sinatra. I like Tony Bennett. Uh, you're like, very traditional. No question. You may dress with a lot of flair, but you're a down-to-earth, very traditional type guy. Uh, when it comes to that type, you of really music, are very yeah. traditional. Music, low key. Yes, I like no that. Question. I like that. Yeah. Voted for Ross Perot. <laughs> Back in the old neighborhood, uh, point out some things to us and, well, and tell us what you remember. This apartment complex, uh, that was our building. And this was the famous stoop because you, you played stoop ball. You would take a little rubber ball and you'd, you'd be out in the street because you'd have to catch it. And, and you hit the stoop and the ball goes flying and you catch it on the fly, you're out. The other person goes. If you can get it to go low, it's a single, single double, that type of game. And you always, when you went out, if it was a certain time of day, be it in the evening or, or as it's just about ready to get dark, you could go out on the stoop. But if you went any further than that ledge there, you were in big trouble. So you could, can't leave the stoop. You could stay out and play and watch and see all the people with a bag of popcorn go by, but you could not leave the stoop. And then one day, I was about, oh, maybe six. And it was the summertime. And I left the stoop. And there was a fly ball to the street. I went out to catch it. And uh, sure enough, got hit by a car. <laughs> hit and, by uh, a car? Yeah, pretty serious. What did it do to you? Uh, it put me in the hospital for a few days. Break but, any bones? No. Uh, I was out for a little bit. But I, the hospital where my mom works is two streets down, Bellevue Hospital. Went down to the street, stayed, and, and I was okay. But it was two, three, two days, and then I learned at that point, you're better off staying on the stoop. This is great. See, if you look at the New York Post, this is what I miss. Yanks go home. Headlines. Do you remember uh, when you were the Knicks and left? Yeah. There was, wasn't there a front page uh, like, thing on you leaving? No. Yeah, the front page said, really nice thing. It said, my old Kentucky home really nice and I got excited. Front page of New York Post, the back page said, he's out of here. <laughs> <That's> it. <laughs> so it's a little different. Have you got and a you... copy of the Post from you leaving? Yes. Did you keep it's a copy yeah. in the frame? No. But this is nice because you get a sweet potato which holds the newspapers down. I think that's a very good touch. So you can't get that in Kentucky. <laughs> sure you can. <laughs> this neighborhood was my fondest memories by far.
this was a great neighborhood. Your playground has changed somewhat. It's been cut down. Oh, it's probably a fourth of the size. But over there was a church, uh, Sacred Heart Church. This is the uh, grammar school here. Uh, the gymnasium is downstairs. And it's a tile floor, and if you shoot with too much arc, uh, you hit, obviously, the ceiling. Um, and this was a great school. This brings back terrific memories here. This is the convent. Um, this is the first time you've been back here in 20-something years? Uh, let me see. Is it that long? Yeah, because when I was a Nick coach, I never came back to, to this area. It's funny, there's uh, a sign down here now, no ball playing. Yeah, it's totally different. And this was so much bigger. But it's, uh, it's changed quite a bit. This is, I used to walk to school every morning and back when it, I had a routine. Again, I, I think we went through this before, is my parents would leave breakfast on the table and they were gone. A quarter of six in the morning, they were gone. I'd walk to school here, play ball, go home, do a little homework, go to Colin Field, and that's where I lived. I lived in Colin Field, and we'll go there next. Uh, from three o'clock in the afternoon to my parents coming to get me, I stayed there at Colin Field because you could play uh, basketball, baseball, softball, handball, stickball, uh, checkerboards. I mean, it was everything in this Colin Field. And that's where we lived our lives at this playground. Let's go to Colin Field. Okay. The way I would go, you know, if you get tired from playing ball, and this happened every day, the way you'd go from your house to Colin Field, not a long walk, maybe half a mile or so, you'd hop on the back of the bus. When the bus would stop, everybody get on, your friends, or you'd hop on the back of the bus. They couldn't see you because windows are high. And that's the way you rode back and forth each day until you got off your stop. When they would stop every every two streets, somebody would ring the bus, get off, and we'd be on the back. And uh, because we didn't want to pay the 15 cents to tow it, so we, uh, whatever it was at that time, but that's the way we commuted. This is where I lived on these basketball courts. Um, we played uh, every day here. Uh, it was it was all half court. Let's go over and see these guys. Hey guys, you got room for one more? I want you to meet somebody. I bet you recognize this guy. This is Rick Patino. And he used to play right here, shoot baskets right where you're shooting baskets right yeah. now. How you doing? All right. That's everything. Good to okay. see you guys. You, you from the neighborhood here? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Over here? How are the games here? They play at all anymore? Oh, yeah, it's different. Yeah? It's yeah. in the summertime. Not as much now as it's coming. Yeah. You couldn't get on. You had to wait two hours when I was growing up here to get a run. <laughs> two hours, literally. You know what I'd like to see? Well, you and Coach Patino play these two guys? I'm in couple. shoes. I ain't here. You used to play bear Rick no, the rifle. Get out of here. Rick the rifle. <laughs> Just a couple of seconds. What do you say? No, I can't play in shoes. <laughs> The guy oh, yeah, could shoot. Yeah. Want to do it? Yeah. Coach Patino. Yeah, coach Patino. Oh yeah. Oh. He likes to play with you. Huh? You I'll tell you what. First. I'll shoot. I'll you shoot got, him. You got the I'll ball sh first. I'll shoot him. Can you shoot? Uh, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll play uh, in the wind. We'll play uh, five shots. For um, I, I get your rebox. You get my shoes. <laughs> All right. Five shots. Oh for one. Air ball, oh, so I get one because you shot an air ball. <laughs> yeah, I know. Oh. There we go. There's one. Right. Now the pressure's off. Yep, yep, yep. You know what? I wear Converse anyway. I got a contract with Converse. I can't wear a Reebok. <laughs> and you said the short fence here in Lee. Yeah. My, that was you ever my, hit one over this yeah, fence? Yeah, I've, I've had a few home runs over this fence. Uh, believe it or not, <laughs> but it's not, <laughs> it's no great feat because, I mean, it's short. Certain days, they would lock the gates, and to get in, they would, they'd close the park on, I'm trying to think, one, two days a week, and we would actually climb that fence. That's a pretty good fence to we'd climb. We'd climb it, get over it, and uh, that's how we got in. Now, you can see, this shot to center field is nothing. Why don't we climb the fence and, and get out of here and go take a look at the yeah. house? Let me do that. <laughs> Who wants to go first? <laughs> That's great. 
it's going to sound strange to you, but uh, it doesn't look the same. Now, this uh, is the home your dad built. He built it. And I can tell by the basketball court in the garage if it is my home. This looks like it's it. And that's it. This that's is it. it. That's it. I can tell by the garage. <laughs> this is the house. Um, <laughs> it's a lot different. Actually, it's not different. I mean, how could it be different? But I recognize the garage because we had, I used to climb it. We had a hoop back there. And um, he built this house brick by brick. He had the foundation laid, and then he did everything himself. He did all the electrical, all the plumbing. He built the garage. And remember, now, all these, all these homes were built mm -hmm. by a private contract or the person themselves. And I'd go down to the corner here. And the bus would make a turn, and that we'd wait till the bus stop, hop on the back of the bus, and we'd take it to Coleman Field each day. With knowing that you're involved with uh, Rick Patino and helping to train his horse, <clears throat> is that uh, any special significance to you, being? He's the head basketball coach of Kentucky. Is that a fun thing for you to do? Oh, it's fun. I mean, we treat all of our horses the same, whether Coach Patino owns them or me or you own them. They all get the same care, but working for Mr. Patino is fun. It's excitable when he wins. He really gets pumped up, and you know, when he loses, he has a competitive spirit. <laughs> Now, if the horse doesn't do well, do you have to run extra laps? Does he make you shoot extra threes, uh, extra free throws? Well, fortunately, I'm not one of his basketball players where he can come take that out on us. <laughs> Maybe he'd like to do that to his horses sometime. Is it, is it a good feeling for you as a trainer to see a horse that's won some races, turn he's won three, and to see the great satisfaction an owner gets from a horse doing that? Well, sure. I mean, it's a, it's a big honor to all of us when you have the success with a horse win two or three races in one year. You know, if a horse wins three races in a year, that's really a good year for a horse. And they're off. Breaking for the lead from the outside, Team Moon quickly on the inside. The first uh, impression that a lot of people had when Rick came uh, to Kentucky as their basketball coach, well, here's this brass young man, a Yankee from New York. He's not going to fit into to, uh, the Kentucky society. Gaining ground from between horses, Turney on the outside. Well, Larry called me, <clears throat> it was uh, a couple of springs ago, and said Coach was of a mind to get a racehorse in order to be a true Kentuckian. On the outside, Turney gains ground. I don't take it as a real serious hobby. In other words, the horses don't run enough. They're not consistent enough. They're not valuable enough to me to take it serious. On the inside, that's Birdie. On the outside, Turney, they're together. <laughs> It was a, a great feeling. It, to see your horse win a race, because it's not easy to do, uh, is a special feeling. But again, if I leave Kentucky someday, I would never own a horse again. If horse racing is not a passion, is golf getting close to being a passion or just a love right now? Because you I seem think to have gotten out, into the sport yeah, pretty outside good Outside of... There's three things I enjoy doing the most. I enjoy playing the game still at age 41. That would, if he says to me, what can you do on a day off? If you can give me a good four and four basketball game, that would be one on my list. Second on my list would probably be playing a great golf course, just walking out there. Although, I, I preface this by saying, if you ride in a golf cart, uh, to me, that goes from having the greatest day to a mediocre day. Oh, he hasn't hit anybody yet, and we're really happy about that. <laughs> These are the shots that are a little rough. <laughs> Not those three Thanks for the now. confidence. Well, I just thought I'd tell you. That's pretty good, Rick. Hey. I was a decent golfer in high school, and I'm, today I still haven't broken a 13, 14 handicap, and I was 11 in high school. So I really haven't mastered it. Who do you think is the uh, most famous of the group? Oh, I have to be one of the coaches. I mean, the other ones get paid the most. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they make all the big bucks, you know, big bucks. That's not us little golf pros. Beautiful. 
This is just for TV, but we're not going to count that first one. I don't want to hear them. You want to hear as many as Vince did? Go no, ahead. I'm, 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 <laughs> I've got a good partner. You put me down with your widget. I'm good. Just want you all to know you're coming down to sing with me tonight. <laughs> but I just love, if I'm walking Pebble Beach or Shadow Creek in Las Vegas or Wingfoot uh, up north here, it's to me a great feeling. <laughs> Central Park is a fascinating place. And in the morning, you can see everybody from, from John, John Kennedy Jr. to uh, rollerblading or jogging, and you see all types of anchormen in the news, movie stars, mm -hmm. and no one pays attention to who you are or, or what you're doing. In Central Park, you just do it. And no, nobody wants to know anything other than their own business. Your, your favorite place, if you could go to one place when you're through coaching uh, and live, You've been a lot of places. You've been all over the world, I guess. Where would that be? Probably Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, to me, it's one of the prettiest spots in the United States. I think it's magnificent. I'm a, uh, from a permanent standpoint, I'm a New Englander. Mm -hmm. If I had to go in for a long weekend somewhere, I'd take the Big Apple. Uh, if I had to raise a family, I'd take Kentucky. Yeah. But uh, for me personally, uh, if I wanted to settle down and retire somewhere, I'd probably go to Newport, Rhode Island. Um, we've we've kind of touched on this before. Um, if you had uh, your druthers, from this point on, uh, the rest of your life, if it could, if everything just fell into place the way you wanted it to, I don't know how it could get much better, but uh, if everything you wanted to do fell into place right now, how would you spend the rest of your life? Would you still want to coach? Yeah, I'd like uh, to coach. To I'd like to coach until at least age 60, and which which gives me about 19 more years of coaching. And then I'd like to. I don't know what I'd like to do. Then I'm not a big look down the road type of person. Although I'm goal oriented, I make it yearly goals. Uh, I never say I'm going to be at a place uh, 20 years down the road. And I, all I try to do is make the year coming up the most special year of my life reaching the goals that we put forth as a team as a family and i don't dwell on the past and i certainly don't look too far ahead in the future because you don't know what life's going to bring you and i've conditioned my mind to be that way not only because of the coaching profession is is one that uh, is unexpected you don't know what's going to happen to you and but i just think it's a good way to live so many people today you hear goals 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 look ahead plan for from life insurance on that they forget mm -hmm. to live in the present. And I'm one to take care of business to while it's here. Uh, having the job you have, being who you are, uh, people are saying, well, we think Rick Pitino wants to win a national championship at the University of Kentucky. He will have fulfilled a goal, and then he'll go back to the NBA. And the thing that's, one of the things that's keeping him at Kentucky is winning a national championship. That's something he's got to have. Have you got to have it? No, I don't think so. You know, the one thing you have to understand about the national championship, you know, I don't know, I think Joe B. Hall coached 13 years. And, um, you know, there are certain coaches, a Dean Smith has coached, I don't know, 30 some odd years and has won two. Mm -hmm. They're very difficult to come by. It takes not only a lot of skill, a lot of preparation, but it, it takes a degree of luck, which I'm not a big believer in, because of the last second shots and, and mm -hmm. the, way, the way March Madness has played. You know, back when, when Coach Rupp was was um, on the sidelines. You had to win two games to get to the Final Four, and you had to buy. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a lot different today. The pressure's a lot different. The media coverage is a lot different. So no, I, I think it's like this: is it, Michael Jordan after he won one championship, should he retire? You know, it's the same thing with, uh, with an athlete and a coach. What you try and do is win a second one. You know, try to win back-to-back -back ones. So mm -hmm. the NBA is probably not in my future anymore. I, I think I, I have now. Uh, coached the New York Knicks, which 
is a dream come true for me growing up so close to Madison Square Garden. So to go back now would not serve any purpose. Um, so I'm not sure I'd ever go back. I can't say never uh, because you never know what tomorrow will bring. One of the things that was swirling was Dave Gavitt wants you to be the head coach of the Boston Celtics. He wants you there. Uh, and you hear that a lot. But he would love to have you. If there's some way he could, he could get you, he would do it. Well, again, it goes back to you know, certainly the Celtic job, like the Nick job, like the Kentucky job, or the Lakers job. They're all special places because of the amount of tradition that each franchise or university offers. But, and the butt part is big. It goes back to what your motive as a coach is. My motive is winning. And the Boston Celtics right now, due to some terrible uh, experiences mm -hmm. that they've had, could be uh, uh, in a rebuilding process that may take 10, 12 years. And I've done all the building that I want to do for a while. I mm -hmm. want to enjoy some fruits of the labor that we put in. And I don't think that that's something you look at. I think that at this stage in my coaching career, you want to look at any situation. Winning has got to be the most important factor in life. Is there a chance that you could spend a long time at the University of Kentucky? Again, I don't look too far ahead. I, I, I would not have signed a new contract if I didn't believe I'd be there for mm -hmm. seven years. So I, 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 I'm planning on, on fulfilling my contract, uh, but I said that a Providence did not, so I think that you have to take it. If everything's, who knows, C.M. Newton could retire. Uh, they hire a new athletic director who doesn't want me to be the coach, he wants somebody else. He wants somebody who talks as funny as you to be, to be the coach. You never That's know, funny, Charlie yeah. Mack. It's, um, it's always changes. Yeah. You can never ever say you're going to be somewhere. You'd like to believe that the situation will stay the same like it is today and that you could you could retire as a Kentucky basketball coach. But I would be presumptuous if I did that, because I don't know if they want me. Are you living a dream from the time you were a kid and, and as your career goes on? Are you living a dream, the dream you wanted to live at this point? I think, I think the next best thing to playing the game of basketball is coaching. So if I was, uh, I wouldn't say I'm living a dream. I think that I'm uh, I have a job that I never ever considered a duty or the workplace. I have a job that I consider my vacation. If I had a choice whether to go uh, on the sidelines. Pretty vacation. It is intense, but it's great. There's nothing like competition to, uh, to bring out the best in a person and to make it uh, more enjoyable. So I love what I'm doing today, but I have always loved it. And I think I'm a very fortunate person. Any person that can spend 75% of their, the moments that they're awake, enjoying themselves, which is the job market, the job place, then they're very lucky. You ready to go back to your old Kentucky home? Yeah, I'm, I'm anxious to get back right now because practice is right around the corner. Uh, and New York right now for me is a wonderful place to visit. There's no better place to spend the weekend. But there's no better place to live right now for me than Kentucky. Let's go back to the bluegrass. Okay. <laughs> is it up here? <laughs>
and now scenes not shown in the original television broadcast. A lot of people don't get to see a coach's office, especially Kentucky Rick Pitino's office. So if you would, let's, let's okay. take a look at it. A lot of pictures over here, awards. Oh, a lot of special moments and obviously family members that you uh, mean so much to an individual. You've got golf here, you've got basketball, you've got your children, your wife. Uh, you've got a lot of mixture in here, so I would think uh, they all make a great mix. It certainly worked for you, that combination. Yeah, I think, I think there are a lot of different things that you're very proud of and uh, things that stick out, not necessarily championships, but things, things that stick out. A, a golf tournament with probably one of my closest friends, uh, Ralph Willard, um, here. And, uh, we have uh, my children, uh, the first radio show that Kaywood and I did where we, we didn't think by piping in the radio show we could draw many people, but we thought maybe a couple hundred would stay around and we had about nine, ten thousand people per game stay around. No Nonsense American Women Award I got. <laughs> where was is, this? Oh, it, it was for hiring Bernadette Locke. <laughs> so I got something for uh, something that was great for me. Uh, they gave me the No Nonsense um, American Woman Award. Uh, Playboy All-America basketball, you're the coach yes. of the Playboy All-America team. And that was obviously with Eric Montrose and Chris Weber and MASH and, and uh, some A.C. Earl and Alan Houston, Anthony Hardaway, some Rex Walters, some, some great names, Rodney Rogers. These pictures over here, all Knicks pictures. And this game here, we were in the first round of the playoffs. U.B. Brown got ejected with 10 minutes to go in the game. And with seven seconds... Uh, excuse me, actually it was 30, 30, I think one seconds ago, we were down seven. We had to call, I think, three timeouts, and, and we, we won it in regulation. Uh, so that was a great comeback. Uh, and this is Bernard King, uh, an athlete that I admired very much and enjoyed coaching him as well. This wall. Well, again, there's a picture of Pat Riley and uh, more family pictures. Tommy Lasorda. Uh, who I got a great kick out of is not a great baseball coach, but an entertainer. You're, this you're, is an interesting award. I was going to uh, ask you about the hundred dollar bill yes, here. Yes, that is from a, a very close friend of mine, New, uh, the New York Knicks team doctor, uh, Norman Scott. We opened the New York Knicks won twenty four games for three straight seasons, and we opened up the season. I think we were oh three and twelve, and and walked in, and I was beside myself with a loss. And he said, "Rick, you lost to the Celtics. What's the big deal?" I said, "We should not lose at home." I believe in when you build a program, you should not lose at home. That's the first thing you have to master. And he said, look, it's not as if you're going to make the playoffs. And I looked at him, and I said, are you crazy? Of course we're going to make the playoffs. And he said, Rick, there's no way. You don't have the team to make the playoffs, and you're, three and you're not going to make it. I said, what would you like to bet? And he said, I'll, I'll bet you anything you want. I said, well, you name it. He said, $100. I said, you got it. So the last game of the season, here you play 82 games. And it comes down to the likelihood of this happening is, is, is not very good. The last game of the season, Indiana, Ken, uh, Indiana, I was going to say Kentucky, Indiana, 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 Pacers. Indiana, Indiana Pacers versus the New York Knicks at Market Square Arena. We happen to play them. The winner makes the playoffs. And the, we were an underdog to beat them because it was on their court. And of all people, Kenny Walker got a piece of Steve Stepanovich's shot at the buzzer for us to go on and win it. 88-86. Right. And rather than that, Cheapskate sent me to hundred dollars. <laughs> <laughs> Put it in the plaque, and if I ever get short, I'm going to rip that plaque apart and take that hundred. <laughs> Loves in your life, Joanne, your children, basketball, uh, New York City is a great love in your life. No question. New York, Boston, uh, very important in my life. It's where my family is located, my mom, my brother. and um, I, had, I think I had three homes. Uh, it was interesting. In one week's time, I traveled to Boston, New York, and Kentucky. And I... Landed in Boston, and the person at the hotel, as well as the cab driver, said, Welcome home, coach. Then two days, 48 hours go by, I go to New York, and the, the bellman, person checking me in, said, Welcome home, coach. And I came back to Kentucky, and I was looking at the people at, at the Delta counter, and they said, Welcome home, coach. And I, I think I've been very lucky. I think I had three homes. Uh, I considered New England a very special time in my life because I went to college at the University of Massachusetts, then spent about, uh, oh, 11 years of my adult life in New England. My childhood was spent in New York. And now the, uh, you know, close to the uh, 40 age and going on is Kentucky. So I've been very lucky. I remember you saying, I guess it was after your first year and maybe the final home game, uh, hearing my old Kentucky home, 
and you hadn't thought much about that before, but I think you made the statement about uh, how that song touched you on that particular night. Well, I think it's a symbol of pride. You know, it's a, uh, not too many songs, uh, you know, what's it, Back Home in Indiana, what's the name of it, or, or what's Tennessee have, the Rocky Top song, or, but I don't think uh, very many states have a song as special as My Old Kentucky Home that identify with the feelings that people have for, for the state. And I think it is a special song that represents um, a feeling that, that's inside of the Kentucky people. Now, one place you like to go to get away for a couple of days really charges you up is New York City for a number of reasons. We've talked about this before. Why don't you and I go to the Big Apple, and why don't you show me what you enjoy doing in, say, two or three days? Okay, Charlie Mack, bring plenty, plenty of Jim Hose's money. We did that. Uh, we got that set make up. Sure got you, the limo you wanted. Okay, make sure you have your duds in order because I don't yep. want you to dress down. You're going to the Big Apple. Okay, you got your Gucci's. I don't have mine yet. Let's get some Gucci's. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Can you give me your feelings as you approach a big ball game and walk out into that arena? You know it's a big, big ball game. Well, it's, it's different. In Madison Square Garden, the only thing I was interested in is getting out there, fighting through the crowd, fighting through the media, trying to get, excuse me, uh, to the ushers, just fighting through everybody to get to your bench, shake the coach's hand of the pro game and just get on with your business. Nobody noticed you. In Rupp Arena, they have guys on walkie-talkies on mic. Uh, clear the floor, coaches coming through, and I, I've never ever had this experience. The amount of respect that you get as a Kentucky basketball coach is way beyond anything I've ever experienced. And um, to me, walking out there is very special because you're a coach amongst so many people that have this passion for the game. They don't play handball anymore? Yeah, they do. Yeah. Sure. How's the team look this year? We'll be all right. I win five, six games. <laughs> Tell me. I have sent you a beautiful tie one day. Did you ever wear it? I wore it for one game. The game you won, no? Against Michigan. <laughs> <laughs> Did you no, burn no. it? Uh, we, won. we won that game. We won. You should have burned it. <laughs> Which game? Which game? Against Michigan. No, no, no. Michigan, we lost. We, I, won it, I wore it to a home game. I think it was the Tennessee game home. We won by 61 points. That was an easy piece of cake, yeah? But, uh, you stop to wearing it, and we have lost it. <laughs> Joanne loves Kentucky now, does she not? You know, I, Joanne kind of had a bad rap in the beginning. Yeah, People did. saying that she did not like Kentucky. She, Joanne lived in Syracuse, New York, where it snowed 150 inches per year. She's lived in New Jersey, New York, Boston, Providence, Rhode Island, and she's enjoyed all of those things because her family was happy. She's a very unselfish lady. She absolutely does not care for herself. She's happy if her children and her husband are happy. So she's a homebody. But she has two parents that are still alive. She has a very close-knit Irish-Italian Catholic family that enjoy being around each other. And for the first time, it's not hop in your automobile and drive three hours to be with your family. It's now a, a, a day's journey, so to speak. So that's the only thing she does not like about Kentucky is she can't hop in her automobile. But to her, She's not like I am, where I'm, I love Kentucky, and I think, uh, I think it's the greatest place in the world because she's not a basketball coach. To give you an idea how big this area was, you had a punch ball game, which was like a baseball game, only where you roll the ball and bounce the ball and you hit it with your hand, slap ball. Then you had two basketball courts, that was basketball was going on. And then against the fence here was Johnny Ride the Pony. I don't know, have you ever no, understood no. that? Basically what you would do is you'd get down against the fence, I would be the, I would be what they call the home base. I'd stand like this. And then everybody would get down this way, and you'd, everybody one behind the other, and there'd be five people crunched down. And the way the game was played was, then there'd be six other people there. And they would take off running, jump to the end, sit, next person would jump, and you had to hold the six people. If your wall did not go down, you held, it's your turn to jump. And obviously, you always went after the biggest, heaviest people to be on your team when you chose, yeah. chose up. And it's called Johnny Ride the Pony. A big, big game in New York. I don't know if they still play that now. Best player you ever coached. Is there one that stands out above all the rest? Believe it or not, I coached Patrick Ewing. You know, all the NBA players. I coached Bernard King, uh, of course, Mashburn. But the best player I coached by far in the way he dominated the season was Billy Donovan because he was a five foot 11 and a half inch guard, 
who reached heights that still to this day, I used to play Billy Donovan one on one, and I'm just a fair basketball player. And I would. Rick, Rick the rifle is just a fair basket. It, it, I saw at, that article. At that age, I was. The range was 35 feet. Well, that's high yeah. school talk, but at age. Or whatever well, I was. This is coaching. a rifle speak. At, at age 35, 36, I'd play Billy Donovan one on one in the beginning and beat him 11 1, 11 2. And to see him go from that point to carrying a very mediocre team and a mediocre coach on his back and just go to the Final Four was just un truly unbelievable what he accomplished as a basketball player. He does so many things, uh, charity things, giving of his time and of his money uh, that a lot of people don't know about. And uh, sometimes you can't get the press to cover that or write about it because it's, they can't sensationalize it and it's not uh, something that uh, maybe they think sells papers. But uh, he is, is that kind of person. And, uh, you know, I don't know the amount of money, but I know he's very generous in a lot of organizations. A lot of his time and effort goes towards helping others. He's a great guy. Contrary to what you may hear, I've never had a lot of money in my life. And after I moved from New York and the housing market depressed, money has never been important to me. And recently I met with someone trying to plan my children's education in life, and he said, well, what are your financial goals? And I said, I have no financial goals. My only goal is to be successful as a basketball coach. If I can do that, my financial goals will be intact. And that's all I think about is being successful as a basketball coach and then all the other things that, that are important in life will fall into line. We've had a good time here, done a lot of things and, and gotten to learn, I hope, a little bit more about Rick Pitino than folks knew before. Well, typical weekend, Charlie Mack, I guess when you, when you get away like this is uh, not quite as special as this one, but you know we've done an awful lot of things. We've gone out to great restaurants. We've had, uh, met some old friends gone to a Billy Joel concert in Madison Square Garden, walked Central Park, and I don't, I don't think it gets any better than what we've done in the past 48 hours. Went back to your old neighborhood. Yes, it's, it's changed quite a bit. I didn't even recognize my, my old house, and, but it, it brought back some great memories for me where I played baseball as a young boy and basketball, and uh, also seeing the old neighborhood and grammar school. I don't think, I think it's been over 20 years since I've done that. Is this a trip that really recharges your batteries to come for a couple of days and uh, to recharge, and it's an electric city, but is this a place you kick back as well? Yes, no question. New York City is, is so many different things to people. One of the problems with New York, it's become unaffordable for the majority of people. It's just so darn expensive uh, that it, it's, it's difficult to handle on a given weekend. You and I do not have to worry about that. Uh, we are on uh, Jim Hosa's expense account. We appreciate that, Jim. And uh, keep, keep the money rolling, Jim. We appreciate it. <laughs> Let me say this. You do know how to spend money. <laughs> we did it the right way. Yes, we did. We? Didn't and, we, Don? You, know, you can't get a hamburger for under $20 in this town. But you, you got accustomed to it right quick. You oh, just yeah. kept saying, thank you, Mr. Host. Can we come back in a couple of weeks? <laughs> if Jim will pick it up, we'll come back every weekend that we have off. <laughs> to order additional copies, send 1999 plus four dollar shipping and handling to Patino Video. 904 North Broadway, Lexington, Kentucky, 40505, or call 1-800-488-3883.